That's your name, son, and if you want us a moment for prayer. Lord, we thank thee for thy goodness and mercy. For all that thou hast done for us, we are grateful to thee. And we see thy thanks given. And we pray, God, that something will be done in these next two nights that will lay the foundation of a great revival to sweep this country. Grant it, Lord. We know that that doesn't lay within the reach of mankind, only by you, our God. Trusting, Lord, that we have found favor and grace with thee, and I open our ears and our eyes and our understanding that we might know how to follow our spirit, while we ask it in Christ's name, amen. Be seated. First, I would like to say that my son just told me that tomorrow night they were planning a healing service, and the prayer card would be at the afternoon service, and it's 6 o'clock at the auditorium. They come early so they could get them, uh, uh, get the people settled down before the service is started. Then I want to say that ever who that brother is here that sent us those fish yesterday, we certainly enjoyed them very much. The whole group of us had a, I guess you'd call it a gastronomical jubilee last night. About 11 o'clock was some of the finest trout I ever had in my life. And I was hungry because I don't eat before these services, and then I was really hungry afterwards. And we certainly appreciate it, brother. I don't even know your name, but I sure thank you. I'd like to make a, what was his name? Paul Harbaugh. Harbaugh. I'd like to make an appointment with you to check some of those someday. <laughs> It was certainly fine. <laughs> and we appreciate it. First time I ever seen any book drop pink, but it was really, it was fine. We thank you all, and I didn't get a chance because I didn't know that they had did it till it was too late. The other night you taken a love offering for me. I certainly appreciate that. I tried to keep my uh, record clear of offering. I've been in the ministry 27 years and never had an offering in my life. I pastored the Baptist Tabernacle at Jeffersonville for 17 years without one penny salary or taking an offering of any kind. I was a state game warden of Indiana, and I worked for my living, and I, money is kind of an odd thing to me. I don't, it's all right, we have to have it, and my expenses at home, it's not much. I, I've tried to keep my services into a place to where they wouldn't run heavy. You take, if I just let it go, I, I might have been under a big obligation. My obligation is about, well, at my office is about, a, I imagine $100 a day will clear me up. Well, you say that sounds like a whole lot better than, what do you think Billy Roberts runs each day? About 10000 What do you think Billy Green runs? I've seen it run 25000 an hour. So he still takes a lot of money. I can't obligate myself like that. My ministry doesn't call for it. I want to just keep it humble so that if the Lord would call me to a church of four or five people, I could go. And I just held a revival in a church that held 20. I had a two-night revival in a little church that held 20 people. It was pathetic. Cold weather and the people standing in sub-zero weather. But it was... Uh, but I felt the Lord sent me there, and I've always raised up some preachers from it. So I just want you to know that I appreciate everything that you do. I've got a wife and three children, and I have a big obligation at my office because we get thousands of letters. You know how it would be, not just one city, the whole world over. And we have four phones that we can answer by, and it's estimated around 40 call long distance calls per hour, 24 hours a day. You can imagine how that runs. And then I send out thousands and thousands of little prayer calls around the world. And 
And I'm uh, not home too much, but I'll tell you where those calls go. Now, the letter, that if you want one, you're welcome to it. Just send everything free. You don't have nothing. We don't have no radio program, no television. Only thing we have is just the Lord Jesus, and he blesses us. But we come to be a help to you, and I'm not wanting your address. It's hard for me to pay for secretaries to answer letters. But everything that you want, one of those little claws, we pray over them and send them out for the thousands over the world. And you're more than welcome to one, just as quick as we can get it to you. And I've used to say many times, the storms never get too hard, and the rain never falls too fast, and the night never gets too dark. But what I would come to you to help you, uh, I have to be careful saying that now, because there's too many. But any time that I could be a favor to you or do anything to help you and make life a little better, so sweet, that's what I'm here for. And I'd, I'd love to do it. Now, remember tomorrow night's closing service, and I'm certainly thanking people for what you've done to us and on this offering that they give. I don't know what it was yet. They haven't told me. But it will certainly go to the best of my knowledge for the kingdom of God. And everything I've just done has to use every penny I get a hold of that I don't use right in immediate work. God knows it goes up straight to the mission field just as hard as it can. Because I know I'm always right. I know what it takes for missions. And uh, that's your following general orders. Then go to all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And I certainly want to be uh, a true steward of what the Lord has given. And part of that money was some of your living. And I respect it just as reverent and honorable as it can be. Well, I want to tell you, my wife not being here, I can say that she usually gets after me a little trick she wants to do. I remember one night coming home, one little thing that I did, it always stuck with her. I was changing clothes in the room, and I we just lived in two little rooms, and I was taking off my uniform, they carried big red handkerchiefs you'd better know in the woods. And going over to church that night, I, I forgot to pick up a handkerchief she had laying on the bed, and I stuck this big red handkerchief down my pocket. And I was always just tabbing out there, preaching away, and I, I got kind of perspiring, and I jerked my handkerchief out to shake it like this, you know, and I was just no face in the world, I said, you know, I'm afraid that I'm living, but they're a nice smile on me, so, <laughs> but so, well, and then, once I was going to take up an offering, and you know how poor people get, you get to a place you can't make ends meet, did you ever hit that place? I still get them. <laughs> and I thought, how are we going to do it? And I said to the wife, I said, I'm going to take up an offering over at church. She said, I'll go over and see you do it. And if they wouldn't do it, certainly they would. They'd give me anything they had. But I was able, strong, working, preaching two or three times a week, so whatever. I can make my own living. And so I went over and we didn't have an offering thing. And I think there's an old fisherman by the name of Mr. Wildhart. He was one of the deacons in the church. And I said, Uncle Jim, I want you to get my hat and folks who want to ask you a question. I said, I've heard kind of a tough place. Think they make ends meet. You got a nickel of dime in your pocket, drop it in the hat, trying to help me. Or some of them crying. I looked down and I seen an old woman who always prayed for me. She wore one of these little aprons. Did you bring up here the well apron had a pocket on the inside, you know, a little on the inside of the apron? She reached down and got one of those little bitty pocket books that snaps on top, reaching down there for a little nickel. Oh my. <laughs> I couldn't do that. Oh, I said, I was just teasing <laughs> And as close as I was from taking up an offering, I couldn't have taken her nickels, and I couldn't have done it. There's an old man come down from Benton Harbor, old brother Ryan, just went home to go, not to John Ryan, not the field of Fort Wayne Brown, where the Jewish rabbi saw. It was little John Ryan. He rode a little bicycle down there, and he gave it to me. It was backslid. Well, I wouldn't say backslid, it was real out of it. It was just in a bad shape. And it was out there, and I went out to the Princeton store and got me a can of paint, painted it up, and put a sign on it for sale, sold it, didn't have to pick up the offering after all. But that's the closest I ever come to taking an offering. But I certainly respect it, and the Lord bless you richly. Now we want you to go right straight to His Word, so, and let's out as early as possible tonight, for tomorrow night, we are expecting.
especially, exceedingly abundantly, especially for the sick and afflicted. So get them out tomorrow night. Let us pray. Author of this book and of eternal life, open to us the inspiration, Lord, that goes with this word. And may we learn to live by the word and by the spirit. And may it be to us tonight a correction and a making ready for the coming of the Son of God. Forgive the sin that's been committed among us today, God, and inspire the ministers that's in our midst tonight to take new courage. Give us all of our divine blessings, Father, as we submit ourselves to thee for the hearing of thy word, and may we have fellowship around the same. For we ask it in Jesus' name, thy Son. Amen. I want to take a little text, which I was intending on preaching something else, but this has come to my heart a while ago. Daniel 5.25. And this is the meaning of the writing. Meaning, meaning, purple, or poison. We are opening our text tonight in Babylon. And we have this under consideration for just a little while. And if you give me your attention and uh, your heart to the Holy Spirit, may he interpret this for us. It's time of the time. Babylon began in the beginning of the Bible. Genesis is the beginning of all things. And Babylon was found in the first of the Bible, and it's found in the middle of the Bible, and it's found in the last of the Bible. So I think it would do us good if we went back and found out where this great city, how it was established, and where it's located, and some things about it so we could get uh, an idea of what our text and reading means tonight. Babylon is located in the valley of Shanghai, and it was built by Nimrod, a son of Ham. And the Babylon, the city of Babylon, was the greatest city in the known world. The word Babylon first means it was the gate of paradise. Secondly, it was called confusion, which means backslidden. And the city was a great place. All the nations around paid tribute to it. All of them were taxed by Babylon. And it became a very wicked and indifferent city. We are told by historians that it was 120 miles around the city of Babylon. That would make it 30 miles on each side. And the streets to Babylon, which are nearly in the days gone by, they didn't make big, broad streets. They made them narrow. Like in Oslo, not long ago, I went down to the main part of the city, and it was so narrow that an automobile could hardly squeeze its way through because it was made for chariots before they had automobiles. And they were told that the streets of Babylon were 200 feet across. And the gates of the city were made some 80 feet tall of solid brass. And the walls were 200 feet tall and was wide enough on top that they could run three chairs in a bus, a horse race, around the city. And it was also the great city had gardens, great gardens along these walls. And the palace set in the center of the 
the city, and every street led straight to the palace. Rome built the same way. This is called in our Bible, Modern Babylon. And all the roads lead to Rome. All the streets led to the palace. And the palace was built over the river Euphrates, which irrigated this great Shinar Valley coming down from the harvest and, and irrigated the valley. It was a great, rich country. And this river was built, or the throne was built, rather, so that the river ran right along in front of the throne. Now, if my friends here, you Bible readers, understand that that was a pattern of the heavenly throne, the river of life flows by the throne of God and the great garden. So you see, it was a perverted version of glory, which belonged and was built and, and brought up by Satan. Like all other kingdoms of the world are ruled and governed by Satan. Now we know that that's hard for us to believe that our nation is that, but the Bible says that it is. All the kingdoms of the world belong to the devil. He's the ruler of them. Jesus, once when Satan showed him the kingdoms of the world and said, Satan said, all these are mine. I'll do with them whatever I want to. If you will fall down and worship me, I've given to you. Jesus knew that he was going to fall heir to him in the millennium, so he said, just be behind me, Satan. Then Jesus takes over these kingdoms, we'll stack arms and never have no more laws. We'll have no more fights or troubles and no more sickness, sorrow, or death. When Christ takes over the kingdoms of this world, they'll sit on his father David's throne to rule our nation. Until then, we're going to have wars and rumors of wars, pestilence and earthquakes and Sickness and sorrows and sin. But this great city, and it was a great city, it had in itself a very beautiful type of the world today. For it had the greatest scientist of wealth in the world was in this city. The greatest army that they know in the world was in this city. The best fed and best dressed people known in the world was in this city. And all of the rest of the known world in those days looked to that city for their example. If that isn't modern America, I don't know where it is. The best scientists, as we think. Best dressed people. And not only that, but their agriculture program. They have the best, but there's nothing all the world today to compare with that battle now. You can raise almost anything there. Perfect irrigation. It's claimed that the Garden of Eden was located near there. And it is a, a great city. And it's Dreams that when God goes to doing something for people, then they get indifferent towards God. I believe it was Solomon, no, I hardly think it was Solomon, it was a might have been, that prayed one of the greatest prayers. When he prayed like this, Lord, don't make me poor enough to beg or to steal, and don't make me rich enough to forget you. Just let me have the comforts of life. And when we get married enough, we begin getting away from God, nine out of ten. And when the nations of the world become great and become a self-sustaining, they think, they begin to move away from God. When man begins to know 
at the time, on the face of the earth, sin and violence set in. Some of you people living here in this lovely little city that you live, it would be hard for me to tell you the sin and stuff that's in these big cities, like Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles. Flying over Los Angeles recently, I took a paper that the hostess gave me in the plane, and I seen there are 185 major crimes we did in the city of Los Angeles each night. 185 major crimes. And immoral was on the loose. And the kind of perversion, homosexual, has increased 60% over the last year. Think of it. And then what of what God said, as it was in the days of Sodom. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And mothers, like the mothers of the boys, that feel so ungodly in their young lives and these teenage racketeers until their natural uh, bodies and so forth is polluted and perverted to they live with each other. Hotel rooms and places. You just don't realize, people, what a condition this place is in. It's a million times worse than you could just conceive. You don't get it on the radio and in the papers. Certainly not. You have to go see it to understand it. And what does that? We were in Switzerland just recently. And a meeting and such an indifferent people I never seen. Oh, they were very religious. On Sunday morning, you think the millennium was on. The bells are ringing everywhere for hours. But cutting feathers with scissors and throwing spells on one another and selfish and indifferent. I picked up the paper the next morning after Billy Grimm meeting, he ended on Saturday and I began the same place on Sunday. And they said that they, re- said they did not stand for him to come, said he had to stand in the best hotel there was in the city. So he went to the pulpit, like going to a band box in the city of the pulpit. Not a wrinkle in his clothes, he had a manicure in his hair, whatever that stuff is, raised his hair. And so he swung his arms like a fantastic American soap salesman. And so the perfume on him, you could smell him ten feet away. I knew I had it coming. What they would say about me. And it was worse than that. They said I was a polished up soothsayer. <laughs> Why? That's the condition of a, a nation that gets to a place where they can live in luxury. They haven't had a war since Arnold Van Rieckelard time. And crossed the border into Germany, where they've been beat to the ground. They come crawling humbly. They were ready. Visit Finland, where the little boy was raised from the dead. Even though songs are minor, lovely, willing to receive Christ. Also, we the now a little Hitler machine gun, that whole bunch of men. Cut the whole nation down to about 24 hours. Crowds of people on the street, all young widow women. Everything was sincere. Then come right back into Sweden. Oh, indifferent. Excuse the expression, but the American expression is cocky. You just get off the street. All oh, big dancers on the street and everything all night long, nearly. There you are. Then you cross when you forget God. That's just the trend of the land. And that's the same thing took place here in Babylon. Although they were no different. Because they had a revival a long time before that under the uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. 
They had a supernatural ministry down there in Babylon. Days before, so have we. And they had signs and wonders among them. God delivered three boys from the fire furnace one morning. They sold a prophet in a lion's den, and the lions were not eating. They know about the supernatural. They know about God, but they were unconcerned because they felt self-centered, self-sufficient. And that's about where we got today, self-sufficient. We don't need anything else. Oh, the Bible says, Thou art wretched, miserable, dying, poor, and naked, and don't know it. In this age that we are now living. Now notice, in this time of these great big high walls, no nation could jump them walls. They were all fortified. Besides that, they had the greatest army in the world. And they had the best chariots, and they had the best spearmen, the best trained men. So they felt like that they could just live any way they wanted to. And that's become the condition of this nation. I remember, I'm, I love this nation. It's my country. And I passed through France and Germany. I walked over the graves of dead Branham. He died for this country. It's the greatest country in the world. But she needs a shaking. And no matter what we do, God's going to judge this nation. It's a just God that has to do it. He spent Sodom and Gomorrah up to the same sins that we're doing now. And if he let us get by to be a just God, he'd have to resurrect Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize for burning them up. If we get by without it. Or you say, but our forefathers, they did so and so. Or how about the Jews? When God told them they were his nation and his people. But when they got out of line, God punished the Jews. And the Gentiles will get the same. It's coming to us. I watch the scriptures. As we come to them, may the Holy Spirit unfold them. Now, in this great city, <coughs> they had a lot of reverie and ungodly living and women and prostitutes, it's called concubines, prostitutes, Hollywood girls, and they had all of that back there in them days. And one day there was the king of a big time playboy, a uh, real good Elvis Presley. And he decided that he would have a big rock and roll party one night. And he made everything ready, so he just sent out invitations to the celebrities of his kingdom. Because he said, nothing can bother us. All them old fogey tales that tell us about certain things, nonsense. Let's keep Jason be low. Let's have a good time. We're modern. We must live modern. And you know, modern, you live first. Look at our modern day and compare it with that. And so he said, we'll have a great party in one of these great gardens that he had. So I can imagine he's getting everything ready. He made it like a real modern telecast. So he got behind the palace, and he sent out the invitations, and all the young ladies and young mothers, uh, they got somebody to babysit for them because they were invited to this party, and all the soldiers were going to be there. They were going to have a great time, just like modern America. And so I can imagine getting their little low neck waist and low backs, and, you know, like they go to these uh, parties, they call it evening Dragons or what more? You know, one time in the Baptist church, I was preaching, and I already, I got a little piece of paper I should have brought. I, I think it's out of Reader's Digest. It said a woman that is sick her clothes on 
to speak like that in front of a man disgraces the whole woman race. And that's wrong. It degrades them. But why they don't have no respect no more, they brought it on themselves. Dressing themselves out on bathing suits and getting the stone pan back, they call it. I've got two girls. I don't know whether I live or not, that's to God. If they ever stick themselves on a beach for a suntan, they'll get a suntan. It won't be from that sun, but it'll be from Mr. Grant and some of the barrel sack. Bring them in just as hard as I can. Oh, it's a disgrace to think that our nation is polluted. And here in this great day, they got ready for the great party they were going to have. And they made ready and got all the whiskey and whip or his or whatever they had in those days and brought it over to the place in the palace and they were going to have a great big time place. It's just a little innocent fun. Sure. So how they got over in this place and the evening lights began to burn and they lit the candles around. And they all got into drinking and carrying on and having a big time. And the music was playing and the dance was going on and they were having a great time. And after they got drinking a little bit and the women got kind of just orderly and didn't care what the man did, and they were throwing around on the arms of these drunken soldiers and maybe a, somebody at home taking care of their baby. You see, that's way back in heathen land, that's here in the United States. Sure is. And maybe Pop sat at home rocking the baby. Why is why I see the beautiful woman was invited to the party? And he become a babysitter. Maybe it was by subversion. That was a popular jitter baby, so he was invited and mama stayed home taking care of the baby. It's a both ways. Sin is horrible. We'll see both male and female. One just as guilty as the other. And when the party got in good flame, all the pencil and the modern Arthur Godfrey began to pull off his little jokes, you know. So he had a great time, and the women swinging and throwing out their thoughts, they were safe. They had everything they needed. They were self-sustaining. So, you know how these hard work guys try to pull off these jokes? It's a disgrace that they don't think that they're programmed. Take those little girls, not 12 years old, out on the street and the boys with their arms around smoking cigarettes, walking down the street trying to impersonate some old prostitute out of Hollywood. And the children of this United States of America can tell you more about why they than they could about Jesus Christ. They can tell you more about David Crockett than they could about Jesus Christ. They're taught and trained and call it modern. It's a disgrace to our very heritage of our forefathers who landed on Pilgrim Rock and kept us as a nation. It's a disgrace to the God of heaven who has blessed us. What makes the people act the way they do? They see it on the television, in the shows, in the papers, and so forth, and try to impersonate. Let me go into your home. Let me see what you read. Listen to what kind of music you listen to. I can tell you what they're made of. What's on the inside of you? That'll come out. I was preaching at the our tabernacle some time ago, and all oh, the Holy Spirit got into the meeting, and some women began weeping with their hands up. And a couple of days after, I met a Sunday school teacher from the First Baptist Church. He said, Billy, I was standing outside. They don't like me too well because they preach divine healing. 
I preach the full gospel. What Christ died, a full gospel, a full redemption. And he said, I was enjoying your message to that woman beginning to cry. And he said, that just made shivers go up my back. I said, do you mean that dear sainted old mother sitting back there weeping and it made shivers go over her back when she was rejoicing in the spirit? If you'd ever get to heaven, you'd freeze to death, boy. You're going to hear plenty of it when you get there. Because the Bible said so. Then he got all excited because the First Baptist Church has a ball team. And I heard him over behind my house was screaming till you couldn't hear yourself think. And I said, what was all that noise over there? He said, you know Charlie Nolan. I said, yes. He said, he hit a home run and three men on base. I said, what you so excited about? If you said that woman was a holy roller, then you must be an unholy roller. <laughs> That's right. See, it's just become so modernized, it's left God out of its program. Used to be our president went to the office with prayer. The cabinet was led in prayer. Where is it today? I appreciate our president we got. I'm neither Democrat nor Republican, but I'm a Christian. But I appreciate Mr. Eisenhower, but you put a Mr. Eisenhower in every county in this nation would never shake it back. We're bullheaded. And we're judgment bound. We've crossed the line between mercy and judgment. We're headed far. So today, they know better, so do we. But they got a bunch of preachers around that said those things just passed back with the grandfather Nebuchadnezzar long ago. And then now they were in this great big carry on rock and roll and having a big time. You know, this modern Hollywood boy, you know, like Steve Picker Ernie, they got a thing. He wanted to pull a joke, so he wanted to pull a joke on religion. You know, the ball-headed preacher or, or something on that order. Well, it's some kind of nutty joke. So he went and got the holy vessel, which you are the vessel of the Lord now, to pull a joke with that. And he said, we'll go get those things and drink some wine out of it. Did you ever see people just want to act smart? Isn't our American land just like that? Spit on your foot just to show you they can do it. Puff smoke and you talk about it's wrong for you to smoke. Stand out and she said, hey, you're the preacher preaching this for me. How do you like this? Looks like you're going to burn soon enough. <laughs> if God burns you to smoke, he'd made a smokestack on top of you or something or another. Give you flu. You wasn't made for such. It's the weed of the devil. Then notice, and a lot of you preachers use it. Shame on you. If you had a pretty example for Christianity, smoking cigarettes, and you deacons, smoking cigarettes, married three or four times, and then a deacon in the house of the living God. That isn't disgraceful. No wonder we're in chaos. No wonder the women are wearing sack dresses and shorts and things like that when you got preachers and deacons like that. Mm -hmm. It's a meal ticket in the sin of a commission from God, then. Notice. And when he was just got all the women laying over on the soldiers' backs and they were doing their little jig dances, we call it out with the shindig. Well, having a big time hooping around, they're all hit, nothing can bother them. They're behind great walls. And I can see this uh, modern jokester stand up, you know, on the telecast and go to get a good religious joke. You had this vessel from the house of the Lord to make fun of it. Poured it full of wine, and just as he started to drink, he looked. There happened to be somebody who could come over the wall. He noticed a man's hand over against one of the big candles was flickering his right on the plaster, writing a message on that that he had never seen such writing. 
So I can imagine as he starts to drink and sees that, his eyes bulge out, his knees go together, and he's really all shook up. <laughs> yeah. Not modern Elvis. The Bible said that his knees beat together and his bones seem like they're just coming apart. It'll be a shaking up time, all right, one of these days. The spot is not too far away. And he really was shook up then. And the first thing you know, some little painted face, Jesse Bell, looked around and said, What's the matter? And then she was all shook up. And then he thought, Well, now wait a minute. No one can get in the gate. The guards are at the gate. No one can get over the wall. We got the wall here. But God can look down. God hates sin. He loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. He loves America, but he hates the sin. He loves his church, but he hates the sin in his church. And it hasn't changed. Spirit don't die. The same spirits as in that people are in these people today. The devil takes his man, but never his spirit. God takes his man, but never his spirit. Remember the spirit is up on Elijah, came on Elijah, then on John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit on Christ come down, same those Pharisees and teachers of Jesus' say, look at them today, look back there and bad on them Gentiles, look at these Gentiles' behavior today, wake up before it's too late to wake up. I'm afraid it is. There he is. And he's never seen anything like that. Oh, he said, call all the district presbyters, all the pastors and the bishops and the cardinals and the popes. Get them all out here. These spiritual men will understand this. And when he went and got all the bishops and the cardinals and the pastors and the popes and got them all out there, they didn't know nothing about unknown things, <laughs> about spiritual things. They never heard of such a thing. Never heard a language like that. And they said, we don't know nothing about those things. Only thing they know was their creed and their prayer book and their theology. If that ain't a pattern of the American church today, I don't know. They don't know nothing about supernatural. They don't care nothing about supernatural. They don't believe in the supernatural. The only thing they know is they're Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, and so forth. That's all they know. Sometimes they don't worry about God being a hot and cock to know about an Egyptian night. And that's the way it stands. As it was then, so is it now. But we think we're secure as long as we're Baptist. I talk about my own church. I guess that's all right. As long as we're Baptist, we're all right. You're not all right until you're born again. You can join all the Baptist churches in the world and go to hell like a martin to its mouth and any of the rest of it. And notice now how it's taken place. And all these bishops and cardinals and so forth, they couldn't understand what the supernatural was. So then they all shook up. They all were. They didn't know what to do. There was a supernatural something taking place, and nobody had the answer. Blessed be the Lord God. The same thing's taking place, and they don't have the answer. There's a handwriting on the wall, and they haven't got the answer. The nation's all shook up. We thought we had the best scientists. We thought we had the best everything. But these are almost a two-ton public circling this place tonight, and we don't know nothing about it. What did Billy Graham say just the last few weeks? There isn't one thing to keep us from being Russia satellite by in the morning. Not a thing. They're so far ahead of us till it's a shame. What does real scientists say about it? Came on interview the other day. Said, should we align with people 
or should we just keep it to ourselves? What do you want to say about it? He said, there's not a thing to keep them from doing it. Do not let us know all their secrets. If a ton and a half satellite up there can go, what would it hinder tonight? There are about six of them to go up and come right over to the United States and say, with these hydrogen weapons, we couldn't get to them. So all that slender are burnt ashes. What would take place? That can happen before morning. It would not disagree with the Bible. It would fulfill the Bible. The nations are ready for it. And not he's all over the world now, but it's in the skies where Jesus said it would be. There will be signs in the heavens above. Man's heart failing. Protect the distress of nations. Protect the time. The sea of Never in all the history have we ever had the big tidal waves that we're having now. Look at Chicago last summer and all up and down the coast. Protect the time. Distress between the nations. The handwriting on the wall. And the return of the power of the Holy Ghost to the church. The prophet said, there will be a day. Listen close now, don't miss this. The prophet said there will come a day that it wouldn't be night nor day. But in the evening time, it would be light. How does the civilization travel from the east westward? Always. China's the oldest civilization. We've already come to where the east and west meet, which we had a few more days. I'd like to preach on that, when the east and west meet. How did civilization and Christianity begin on the world in the country? By the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the appearing of the Lord Jesus, signs and wonders taking place. Then the lights went out. It's been a day of dismal, neither night nor day. What is it? Enough to say there was a Bible. Teach it as a historical thing. Something happened back there. But no power. Just go with this joint church and that's it. It's just dismal. We haven't got enough light. But when the sun goes down in the west, he promised that he'd shine the same light on the western people that he shined on the eastern. Oh, it's here! The Lord God has come in the power of the Holy Ghost, and he's shown the same signs and wonders that he showed on the eastern people 2,000 years ago. He's been dismal and dark, but in the evening it shall be light. At the end time. And then days the church to rage in the Broadway. A man's heart failing. More heart disease. What does not women? Man. You ever said women's heart? Man's heart. Both science and church companies say it's 90% man. Man's heart failing. A sign of hope. Fearful sights in the heaven above. Suddenly. Oh, we thought we had as secure as we could be, so we'd give away to modern rock and roll and sin and carrying on and indulging in the things of the world and let the church alone, staying home on Wednesday night to see We Love Susie, the televisions and things, and let the church sit without anything. And one old fashioned pastor out and put a little peaky headed Hollywood rat in there that knows more about dogs than a rabbit knows about snowshoes. And put him in there and call him your pastor. Electing something like that. What we need today is the old fashioned, terrifying, big song preacher back in the pulpit to handle the gospel. Barehanded. Called black, black, and white, white. We played religion too long. The Bible said that. You may not love me so much after this, but it's a judgment bar. See what's right and wrong. This comes from the Word. Watch now. Oh, he was all shook up, and the bishops was all shook up. They don't know what to do. They can't, uh, they can't, got, I haven't got an answer for this. And neither do they have. They can't do it because they know that there was a God of heaven. Then while all this was going on, did you notice at that time, the little queen come running into the banquet hall. She hadn't been at the rock and roll party. She might have been praying somewhere. And she come running in. She was there indulging in their sins. And she come running in and she said, Oh, King, live forever. She knew he'd be killed in a little while. But she regarded him. Yes, Bishop, 
Yes, Reverend. Yes, Doctor. That's all right to regard, but the time is at hand. She said, Oh, King, live forever. She said, Don't be all shook up. For there is a man in your kingdom that understands the supernatural that can interpret those tongues there. Blessed be the Lord. There is a man today. That man is Jesus. There is a man that understands the supernatural. There's a man that can interpret this age that we're living in. There's a man in our midst who's got the answer to these questions, the Lord Jesus. There is a man, he said, he said, who has an excellent spirit, the spirit of God is within him. And he can understand because he has revelation and interpretation. And he'll understand it. And they said, send and get this man. To eight men, you ought to listen to that man before this happens. Send and get the man. Let's see what he'll say. And they sent and got Daniel. Now, they wasn't blind. They brought that on the top of Daniel's teaching. They brought that on the top of his powerful preaching and the signs and wonders that he had done and still living in sin. If that ain't modern America, I never seen it. On the top of the old fashioned preacher. Throw him in jail if necessary. Get rid of such an old fanatic. We don't want him. Walk right on the top of it. And then they hate him and call him all kinds of bad names like holy or something like that. We don't have to tolerate that. We got a church that's got sense in it. But has it got spirit in it the next time? So they got on the top of Daniel's teaching. And so they didn't know what these things were. And some of our preachers today has let down. I read an article here not long ago. I got it in my scrapbook. Where that the American preachers, they take an analysis of who believe in the literal coming of the Lord Jesus, and 78% of the American preachers deny the literal return of the Lord Jesus. Bad one. And it was more than that denied the virgin birth. How you expect to build the church of the living God upon such ruins and charles of Sodom as that? It'll never work, then. So what you so hard about, Brother Benham? I come here for one purpose, to lay a foundation for the revival. Until we get back to the old healing line, you'll never have revival. The church has got to be cleaned out and started over again. On a foundation of Christ the solid rock, all other gems and denominations are sinking sand. They'll have passed. But I'm afraid we're almost too late. It's in the sky. What did Daniel say? What do you think that holy prophet said when he stood before the king? He said, I'll tell you what I'll do, Daniel. I understand that you can interpret things, that you can interpret strange languages. And again, that you can have revelations and visions. Daniel, if you just come here and hold a revival book, we'll give you all the money you want. And some modern Daniel would have fell for that that quick. But Daniel said, keep your gift to you. There's the man of God. You're not making me no bishop over these guys. I don't want no bishop or doctor's degree. I want to remain Daniel in the will of the law. And if a lot of you preachers have quit trying to put so much emphasis on that doctor and bishop and presbyter and things like that and get back to be a brother and a servant of Christ, bring this church together, be better. Feathers and hats. What you need spirit in the heart. <laughs> and there they were, and here we are. The handwriting's on the wall. Daniel said, you ought to know better than this king. Your father, Nebuchadnezzar, had that kind of spirit on him. You knew what God did for him. But said, besides all of this, your days are numbered. Not at that same time, where they thought they were secured, 
with all the best scientists, the best soldiers, the best equipment, the best everything, the Medes and Persians, an ungodly nation, many miles away, historians tell us, had bypassed the river Euphrates. They couldn't get over the wall, certainly not. They couldn't get into them, but they were ready for them. And an ungodly nation had cut down a ditch and bypassed the river Euphrates down through the mountains and cut this little gap in two and bypassed the river and right while them waiting in them soldiers' arms. And when they got their drunken condition with all their ungodly sexy clothes on, and the man of Babylon and the modern Hollywood Elvis Presley's and all the rock and roll, right in the midst of all of that, the supernatural was on the wall. What happened? At that very hour, the Medes and Persians had then chopped down the guards at the gate, coming under the wall where the river runs. Coming was on the steps, and all them dirty eyed women and men so drunk they could hardly hold one another up. And of hours for men, them women was ravished publicly, right out on the street by the man, and killed, busted their heads, and Kill the children and just a massacre. Listen, friends. Right now, while we've been all of our putting our time to making sex our God, and putting all of our time to Hollywood and all of that kind of nonsense, and bringing it into the church and sipping our women and taking the spirit away from the church and all these things. Russia's been fixed in the sudden. The handwriting's on the wall. The nation's all shook up. Hour after that, soldiers streamed into there and cut their cities, cut their houses, kill their team. What would happen? It's right this very hour. If the sudden stop over the states and say surrender, what would the Pentagon that's all shook up tonight about it? What would they do? You, you hear the news, you, you see the papers, they don't know what to say about these things. Russia is taking pictures of us tonight out of a study. They don't know what to do. Oh, she's all shook up, aren't we? Notice, sure, you put their time on God in a single, only rotten stuff that we're doing, it wouldn't have been this way. But you see what's happened. All right, by this time tomorrow night, hear me, there's not a thing, not one thing that would keep shipload after shipload, plane load after plane load of Russian soldiers out of here grabbing these women and ravishing them in the street and doing what they want to, coming if they like their house, kick you out of it, and that's it. What are you going to do? Ungodly, barbarous man who doesn't know nothing about God and cares that much less. You say, God does that? He certainly does, according to his Bible. He has a punishing whip when his people won't obey. There's not a thing. What would our pedagogy do if Russia did such a thing and say, now surrender or go to ashes? We'd have to surrender. Only sensible thing to do to be surrendered. They're up there. We can't bring them down. They've got their guns on us, just about three or four of them bombs, and that is the whole thing. Oh, he's all shook up, brother and sister. The nation's under such a tremendous nervous condition tonight, so they don't know what to do. A great lot of said the there's one little tag between the smartest of us and total insanity. Weighed in the balance and found wanting. A Christian nation. Rock and roll. All this ungodly stuff that we're having. Where are you right at? Then having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, some such turned away. Oh, they were religious. Jim called them bishops and cardinals and all. They were religious. We're religious, but the wrong kind of religion. Religion means a covering. You might be covered by the Baptist Church, Presbyterian, Methodist, Pentecostal. You've got to be covered by the blood, the blood of the Lord Jesus. That's the religion of Christ. These signs shall follow them that believe. Christ is here. It was my privilege about two years ago to go to India. 
Listen to What's the handwriting? Where are we at? What's going to happen, Brother Bernie? You're not going to leave us hanging here. Yes, I'm going to tell you. There'll be a horrible thing for you out from under the blood. But what's going to happen, that Brother Bernie? We Christians who live godly and saintly and believe God and everything, let me tell you, dear friend, you'll be gone before that time comes. If that, listen, the Bible teaches that the church will be raptured before the tribulation. You know that. Everybody knows that. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, and in the days of Lot, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. In the days of Noah, not one drop of water fell from heaven till Noah went in the ark. In the days of Lot, not one bit of fire fell from heaven till Lot got out of Sodom. And not one bomb can drop until his blessed church be resurrected and taken into the world. And if destruction is this close, how close is the coming of the Lord? It has to happen before the destruction and annihilation. It has to happen. Can you see the handwriting on the wall? There we are, the handwriting in the sky. Echabar on the church. The Spirit of the Lord has departed. Where are we standing? What's the matter? This is a horrible time. Notice, when I went into India, I picked up a paper. The Archbishop of the Methodist Church and many of them met us there. I picked up a paper. And it had something written there in English. And it said, it must be that the, the earthquakes are over. A few days before the earthquake comes, the great earthquake, you had it here, you heard of it, it shook all India about two years ago. But India doesn't have uh, fences like we had, they have rock fences. And there big high towers around the fences where they live. And all the cattle stands around on the, on the west side so that the, the sun won't get on them in the day. Little birds build their nests all in these little coals. But a day before the earthquake taken place, every little bird left and took off into the bushes. All the cattle and sheep and the stock around the big walls got up and the walls and stood out in the middle of the field together. The earthquake struck and shut the walls down. The God that told the birds and the bees to go in the ark. Still lives today. And if God by his spirit could make a little bird and a sheep and a cow get away from destruction, how much more will it do his church when we see destruction coming? My brother and sister, get away from these modern Babylon walls. You're going to fire one of these days and you'll be the victim of them. Get out of it, my people, and see you separated, saith the Lord, and I will receive you. And you'll be sons and daughters underneath. Now be a God unto you. We're at the end time. The writing's on the wall. Echabod on the church. The Spirit of the Lord has departed. The church is being made ready. Come out. Walk separate. Get out. Run to the middle of God's salvation. Hang on to Christ until the hour of His wrath is passed. The signs and wonders of His near coming, of the approaches that's coming. Near now at hand. This spirit right here now. I feel, I hope you don't judge me a fanatic. If I am, I don't know nothing about it. I believe to be the servant of the Lord God. And after this great striking things that I've said about the end time, remember, Jesus promised to appear here at the end of the Gentile age and do the same thing that he did when he represented himself to the Jews. How did he do it? By discerning their thoughts and telling them where they'd been and all about such things. Yeah, was that right? How many knows that's true? That was the last sign before destruction. Here it is again tonight, the same Holy Spirit, the same Jesus in the form of the Holy Spirit, with his picture taken the pillar of fire, every scientific thing like it was in those days in Babylon. Here it is right back again tonight. We're at the end time. He knows all about you. You believe that? Now, before I ask you to surrender your life to Christ, there's no prayer cards giving out. Billy has to give them out for two nights. We're going to tomorrow night. But I feel that God wants to show you that He's present. 
so that you'll flee away from it. Flee away from the walls of this modern religion, folks. Come out and get a hold of Christ. I don't say, now, don't be a Baptist, don't be a Methodist. You be a Christian. I don't care what church you go to. You just hold out on to Christ and love him with all your heart until he anchors the Holy Spirit in your heart. Then you're sealed to the day of your redemption. O oh Lord God, creator of heaven's earth. There is many here tonight, Lord, who are real reverent people, who love you and believe you, who is waiting for the coming of the Lord. There may be some here who are indifferent, some here to hear the first time. O oh, eternal and blessed God, will you do for us tonight exceedingly abundantly? Do something like you did as you raised from the dead. Do it now as you did before you were crucified. Let your spirit be upon us, Lord. Do tonight as you did the woman that touched the ball of your garment and went out and sat down in the audience. And you turned around and said, Who touched me? All of them denied it. But you looked and you found her that had that disease and told her that her faith had healed her. The same God that told the woman at the well she had five husbands, she said, I perceive that you're a prophet. We know when Messiah come up, he'll do that. Lord, you never did that before the Gentiles in your days. The Gentiles had 2,000 years of this modern Babylon, but the handwriting's on the wall, Lord. Science can see it. Every person can see it. Newspapers, televisions, radios, everything's a blasting it. There's nothing we can do is there. We've had Delta Stager's big rock and roll party. And you've looked down and seen our sins, Lord. And now judgment's at hand. Oh, Lord, let sinners flee to the mercy of God. Damn it, Lord, may this be message. I can't do nothing about it, Lord. I have not the strength. But let your Holy Spirit sink that into people's hearts so they can see what it really means. Damn it, Father. Now to let them know that you haven't died, that you still live. The God that made this prophecy still lives tonight. He confirms his words by the same signs that he confirmed then. Let it be so, Lord, at least two or three in the building, or we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please, five minutes now. What these things done seen? I take it from God's word. I know it might disagree with creed. I'm not responsible for creed. I'm responsible for God's word to God. Does he live, Brother Bannon? Have we the assurance that he'll that we'll, we'll be saved? Yes, sir, he lives. All other religions besides Christian religion is false. Buddha, Muhammad, I stood with the Bible in one hand and the Koran the other and defy tens of thousands of Muhammad and say, Come here and let me see him make one promise come true. He can't do it because he's not God. He's dead and in the grave, but our Christ raised again. He's alive forevermore. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. No matter what they think about Muhammad coming on his white horse, I've been in his grave and seen the white horse and what Buddha was that died about 2,300 years ago and all the, them things. That's just philosophy, like Confucius and many other great philosophers. But there was only one man ever lived on earth that I have power to lay my life down and take it up again. Lo, little while in the world won't see me no more, yet ye shall see me, for I will be with you even in you to the end of the world. The works that I do shall you also promise me things. And here we are at the end. Do you believe we're at the end of the age? The handwriting's on the wall? Then it's time for Christ to reveal himself to his church. That's what he does. Just as he, if he did any other thing besides he did it the first time, he'd be doing wrong. What did he tell Peter? Your name is Simon. You're the son of Jonas. He believed him. Told Nathaniel, you're just an honest man. How'd you know me? He said, said before Philip called you, when you were in the tree, I saw you. He said, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. What did those educated modern Baptists of them days say? The ecclesiastical world? He's the elderly brother fortune teller. Where are we at tonight? You be the judge by the scripture. Yet religious, holy, sainted, what is sin? Unbelief. Only one sin, unbelief. No matter how clean you live, while some of the hot and pots in Africa would make you Americans feel ashamed of yourself by their morals. 
listen, in the Shunga tribe of South Africa, if a young girl fails to get married when she's in Ohio, she's the one she's woman, and she hasn't got married, she has to take off her tribal paint and come down into the city to the compound. She's not there anymore. There's something wrong with her. And before she's married, she's tested for her virginity. If she be found guilty, she has to tell the man that done it, we're both killed together. Well, if we did that in America, you'd be living. There you are. Heathens in their morals are cleaner than we are supposed to be Christians. Godless, but believe. If the Lord God will do a performance before your eyes, here tonight, the things that he did when he was here on earth, like he did to the woman, look out through the crowd, and somebody be healed, would you believe him? Now, if I said, this boy said he healed, he's healed. I don't know him. I don't know none of you. Well, if I, I said, this boy is healed, he'd have the right to doubt that. But if the Holy Spirit will go back and tell him where he's trouble is, like he did the woman at the well, then that's the Holy Spirit. Maybe he granted it. Then I'm going to invite you to the altar. How many sick people in the building raise your hands and say, By that God be merciful and heal me tonight? Raise up your hands. Everywhere in the building. Thank you. All right, you can put your hands down. Just trying to get a conception of what was it. Let's get right in here and see if the Lord God. May he grant it, friends. Remember, I'm your brother. It takes your faith. I've explained it night after night. doesn't need it now. I want you to know the handwriting's on the wall. You see that with your eyes. Christ promised to do these things when he re- uh, just before his return. That's right. Types it all through the Bible. Here it is right here. Will he do it? He always keeps his word. He can't fail. Let's just be ready. We're waiting on you, Lord. You know we are. We're helpless without you. We need you, O God. Come, Lord Jesus. I just preach you really hard to the people. I want you to back up your word, Lord. Let them know that I've told the truth so that they can see that the supernatural is here. Christ lives. Grant it, Father. Here it is. Good gentlemen standing around the end of the street. Praying. Kind of brown looking suit on one of the glasses of gray in his hair. You are praying to say, let it be me. I don't know you, do I? I'm a stranger to you. If that's right, just raise up your hand. It's the man behind you, so that it's a light over him I'm watching. We've never met in our lives. There's something, you're aware that something's going on right there now. If that's right, raise your hand like this. Now that angel, that light hangs right over the man. If God will tell me where your trouble is, just like he did you, Christ told the woman where her trouble was, will you accept it? Believe it? It's something about blood. No, it ain't. It's artery. Artery trouble. That's right, raise your hand like this. You're a fine man. You believe you're healed now? You believe you believe it, wave your hand like this. I tell you something, you believe me to be his prophet now? His servant? Christ's servant? The rest of you believe that? He said if you get the people to believe you. He just said, look on us. That's your brother sitting next to you. That's right. And your brother has a honey and he's deaf in his ear. He was. The woman had helped him put his hand to rise. That's his wife. Correct him. Now, you're, you're, uh, you suffer with an asthmatic condition coughing from your throat, and you're both from out of town. You're from Canada, and this is the last night you can be. You're planning on going home after the night service. If that's right, wave your hand. 
You believe the Lord God? What do you know, Joe, here does something, something next year? You believe me to be his servant? You do? All right. You have arthritis and stomach trouble. Raise up your hand. You believe it? It'll be over then. Have faith in God. That little lady saying that kind of thing, thank you, Lord, like that. Something scuffled. She had an incurable ear condition. But that's right, lady, stand up on your feet. You did have one. You don't have it now. God blessed you, and your ear cover is cured. What did she do? She never touched me. She touched the high priest, Jesus Christ. He's here. The handwriting's on the wall for the sinner. Christ is here for the believer. Do you believe him? Let's bow our heads just a moment. How many wants to receive him now as your Savior and your lover? Raise your hands to him. When you say, me, Lord, me, Lord, look all over the building, up in the balconies, me, Lord, I know you're here. I can see and know the public's in the sky, the handwriting's on the wall. This nation's gone. We're all gone. Nothing left, no hope at all outside of Christ. I want you, Christ. I'm a church member, but I haven't got the Spirit of God in my heart. Be merciful to me, God. Raise up your hands. Hold up. If you're ashamed now, you may be baby too late in the morning to be ashamed. Raise up your hand. Tell him from your heart, I love you, Christ. God bless you. What about the balcony? Go here to my left. Raise up your hand. God bless you, young man. God bless you, young lady. Back in here. Someone else? Around here? What is your shame now? What will it be when he comes? What in the morning you may never live to see, to make another decision. This may be your final one. What about over here? Church member knows that you're not right with God or sinner. Would you raise your hand and say, be merciful to me, God? Put up your hands to him. He'll hear you. He'll, God bless you, little boy. The Bible said a child shall leave them. People say he is old in age. You just pull your heart through old two-story magazines and Uncensored television programs tell you're so muddy and black and dark that your heart can't be touched no more. You've passed the place between mercy and judgment. And that little tender had a bell raised his hand up like that. Shame on you. God's word. God's judgment. God's spirit. What more can he do? Let us stand. I feel strange. Brother and sister, I'm doing my level best by the help of God to lay the foundation. What you've got to do here, if, if there's ever a revival that will strike anything less, if I ever see one speck of mercy left, if you knew any people. Right. Now believe me, if you believe me to be his servant. And unless this church is built upon the rock of Jesus Christ, with His power, His Holy Spirit, His sanctifying blood to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, you're fighting the wind. Every one of you, friends, it takes all of us together to bring this revival. Let us pray and ask God to send us a real old-fashioned revival. Pour out His Spirit on New England. And set these ministers' hearts to fire throughout the country and save such as can be saved. Will you pray with me? Let us raise our hands for our Savior Christ. Each one of you, the way you pray at your church, Baptist, you pray, Catholic, you pray, Presbyterian, you pray, Pentecost, you pray, Holy Father, you lead us. God, the glory! Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, tonight we come to the Lord.